Hello everyone, welcome back to the very last talk for this year's Linux Conf AU. Alright, to wrap things up on a fascinating note, um, we have Indu Pagat um, and Nick Alcock telling us about compact C type format in the uh, new tool, tool, tool chain. Uh, tool chain was like the easiest word to pronounce in that entire title and I messed it up. Okay. Uh, Indu is part of the Linux toolchain group at Oracle. In the recent few years, her focus has been on CTF, BTF support in the new toolchain. Uh, Nick, who is not able to uh, join us, sadly, due to time zones, um, is a free software developer currently working on Dtrace, CTF, new bin utils, and other tool chainy things at Oracle. Um, so yes, uh, Nick is not able to join us, but Indu is here. Um, this is a pre-recorded talk, so Indu will be joining you all in the chat. Um, so feel free to have a nice time chatting away during the talk. Um, Indu, would you like to say a few words? Uh, I welcome everyone, and I'm grateful to be here presenting this exciting talk uh, about compact C type debug format. Um, I hope you guys enjoy the talk. Hello everyone. Welcome to the talk on CDF, the compact C type format and GNU toolchain. I and Nick will be doing the talk jointly today. So let's get started. For those of you who have not heard of CDF before, hopefully this is an exciting and a useful um, talk for you. We will talk about what CDF is all about and how to generate and use it. If you have heard of and played with CDF before, I hope this talk will still be exciting for you because we will talk about adding useful new extensions to the format which will be included in CDF v4. So let's get started by first looking at what is debug information. Debug information is the metadata that conveys relationship between the executable version of your program and the original source code of your program. It includes information around um, types of program construct, source location information, um, information for virtual stack unwinding, and so on and so forth. Um, there have existed many debug formats, and many of you would have heard of or even used Dwarf. It is the most commonly used uh, debug format. It is very effective for ELF executables. Dwarf debug information is available uh, via the debug underscore sections. Dwarf is designed for expressiveness and is very powerful. It works for a variety of platforms, ABIs, and languages. It encodes types, source location information, unwind information, call site information, and much more. It's quite comprehensive. But there are some issues with Dwarf. Um, it is large. And in practice, it is voluminous enough that most of the time it is stripped out or shipped as a distinct package or not shipped at all. Uh, it is complex. Interpreting some aspects of Dwarf need you to implement a small stack machine or have access to a small stack machine where uh, these Dwarf opcodes need to be executed and Dwarf expressions need to be evaluated. And it's not just the the uh, it's not just the dwarf expressions or the need to have a uh, stack machine that adds to the complications. There are other aspects of dwarf that sometimes make it too bulky a format to get the job done. It is slow. And as we will talk uh, later today, for a specific use case of online debugging, uh, dwarf based methods are not the first choice. So here comes CDF with its niche offerings. Uh, CDF is compact and fast. CDF can represent types for all C constructs. It can be used to provide a C application full runtime visibility into its type system. The second most important feature, which is currently work in progress, and uh, we will talk about this in the latter half of the talk, is generating backtraces. Mm, CDF. Um, aims to provide a fast, compact way to generate backtraces. 
the support is being targeted to be present in the tool chain. So putting all this together, CDF can help alleviate some of those uh, issues uh, with Dwarf by providing uh, some means of debugging if Dwarf methods are not preferred or not possible. So what is CDF? CDF stands for Compact C-Type Format, and as the name goes, it describes C-types of a program. It originated in the Solaris kernel in the mid-2000s to describe the kernel debug information and was later ported to Linux. Uh, what we have today is the Linux ports version 3, so CTF v3. Dtrace on Linux has been a consumer of CTF, uh, but, but, but CTF in general is a debug format. It is independent of uh, Dtrace. The CTF spec is available at this location and also in um, Bin Utils Master. Now, because CTF and Dwarf are debug formats, sometimes this question of how do the two for debug formats compare does come up. And to that question, my opinion is that this is not a meaningful comparison. CTF and Dwarf serve different set of use cases. Dwarf is the most comprehensive debug format that serves the need of most offline debuggers. CDF, on the other hand, is type information for C only at this time. Uh, it does not have any location information, no complex expressions to be evaluated, hence no stack machine in the reader, etc. So Dwarf encodes a lot more information, and the format itself is very different from CDF, even for representing just types. And CDF, on the other hand, is a more compact, simpler format, which makes it faster to load. So overall, I would still say that this is not a meaningful comparison. Um, but so let's see, in the next few slides, I will describe um, the CTF formats. So if you know Dwarf, you'll be able to appreciate the differences between the two formats. And hopefully, you'll have an opinion of your own on this matter. Um, so let's get started with uh, some details on CTF debug format. Um, Apart from the spec, CTF format is also documented in a CTF.h header file installed by Binutils. Um, at the heart of CTF section is a CTF dictionary, which is just um, which is just a name for a set of CTF types. Uh, these dictionaries can be arranged in a parent-child relationship called CTF archives. For much of the discussion today, we will focus on CTF dictionary as it is the crux of the CDF section. So each CDF dictionary has multiple subsections where each subsection stores type information for a class of C constructs. So if you if you can look up the if you if you want to look up the type of the variable in your program, you can follow the variable subsection. Similarly, you can know the return type and the argument type of um, a function in your program by following the um, function subsection. All the strings for variable names, struct names, etc., they appear in the CTF string table, which sits at the very end of the CTF dictionary. The CTF types subsection is an array of variable length entries. So um, each of these struct CDF S type is followed by variable optional variable length data. And each type has an ID, which is simply its index in the array. So type ID is not explicit in the CTF format. CTF S type underscore T struct is used to encode the basic information for any type in CDF. So let's see what it looks like. Uh, CTT name here stores an offset to the name in the CTF string table. Each type needs to have either a size by itself or refer to another type. So for example, if it's a type def, it will refer to another type via the CTT type, but it will not just have a size right here. CTT info, let's see, CTT info is in effect a tiny struct itself, which encodes the kind of the type. Uh, so it tells you whether it's an array, pointer, type def, struct, integer, and all that. And the number of subsequent entries to expect after CTF S type struct, right? So there needs to be a way where each type, where, where the reader of CTF type knows what follows CTF S type underscore T, and CTT VLAN is just that. So the number of entries that follow 
a specific type depends on the kind of type. Some, in, some types like integers have a fixed number of bytes that follow. Other types like structs and functions have a variable number of struct members or you know function arguments respectively, uh, each of which gets an array element given its a name, type, and offset. So maybe let's see some examples to, to put it uh, perhaps more clearly. So let's, with that background, let's put it together for integer data type. As you see, CTT name points to the string int in CTF string table. CTT info tells you that the kind of type is CTFK integer. CTT VLAN is set to zero. And a CTF S type underscore T, the first block, is immediately followed by a variable length data, which for int is a 32-bit um, data, data stream. It encodes, in this case, whether the integer is assigned one, uh, signed integer or not, and other details. Um, OK, let's work out another example for array uh, representation in CTF. An array type in CTF is represented by using a CTFS type underscore T followed by a CTF underscore array underscore T object. So in this case, the CTT name points to a null string in the CTF string table. CTT info tells you this type is of kind CTFK array. Uh, CTT VLAN is again set to zero and unused. The variable length data in this case is a struct CTF array underscore T, which specifies a reference to the type of the array and the number of elements. So that's it, putting it together. The CDF types refer. So this pictorially shows you that for a sample uh, C code, this is the kind of types you will see in your CDF type subsection. The And, and so the CDF types reference so in this diagram here, the CTF types reference each other to create a representation of the types in your high-level program as shown. Um, and in this pictorial layout the, here on the right side, the types in white are basically base types. The pink ones are pointers. And um, the yellow ones are sort of composite types, structures, and so on. So all this helps give you an idea of how these types weave together to give you a true representation of all the types in your program. So far, we've only been dealing with single object files, but no one, no one runs a single object file executable and, and, and shared libraries, what people are interested in. So we, uh, we, we did with this by having the link of spot CTF in, in, in incoming object files and deduplicate, deduplicate it all together um, so, that, so that no type appears more than once in the output. Um, it, the, the, the linker also hunts around and finds symbols that are going to, um, and, and, and finds all the all the symbols that will appear on the output. And so if they have types that have known types, um, it, it builds a table so, so the CTF users can associate the types without um, can ask. Given this symbol, what is it? What is its type? And get a type back. Um, this is all in the light implemented in the library. The linker uses it. Anyone else can use it as we can use it as well. It's not tied to GNOLD in any way, anyway, except that it appears in BinUtils. The duplication is fast. Notice the timing on the next slide. It seems to be reliable. It saves a lot of space. Um, but there's a wrinkle. C is annoying. Unlike C++, there is no one definition rule. Types can have different. It can have the same name but completely different definitions in different translation units. We spot these types and any types they uh, uh, any types they relate to, and put uh, and put them into in, in, in separate child dictionaries, um, which have uh, um, which are, which are connected which are connected to the pa uh, uh, to the parent and share and and, uh, and 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 if you look at if you look for a type in the in, in the uh, child, you can see all the parents types as well. Um, if child, if ambiguous types are present, we emit an archive of CTF dictionary, dictionaries into, into the um, output executable or shared library rather than a single dictionary. Uh, but this is mostly transparent to the user. Um, as in, even if there is no, if, even if there is no archive present, the API makes it appear to be a single single member archive. Um, we, but because we merge all the CTF into a, into a single section, we do not track which translation units define which types. Debugging users mostly don't care, and it would be an enormous ex expense of space, because often most translation units define most types. 
here's an example of, ambig of ambiguous types in this situation struct that the foo is a structure in one translation unit and ambiguous 16t in the other um, and you, and you can see, and you can see here that all the types end up in the shared, shared .ctf um, archive member, except for, except for the one which is varying, which appear um, which, which appears in in both um, in the appropriate person um, person you child. You'll note that co has disappeared entirely. It has no, um, it, it, it has nothing which isn't present in, in other. Um, it has nothing ambiguous, and so it, all the types have fused into .ctf and it vanishes. LD can be asked to distribute types in other ways, but this is, uses far less space than the other approaches, so we thought people are likely to want to use almost all the time. The result is pretty good as far as sizes go. All the sizes here are sizes of the .ctf sections, and they're sizes of uncompressed .ctf sections. CTF is almost always compressed unless it's tiny, currently with GZIF. Um, I'm only doing the uncompressed sizes to make uh, uh, to show you just how large the reduction is. Um, so the you know, LD drops from 3.2 meg of CTF on the uh, uh, on the input to 200k on the output and 60k 70k after compression. Emacs drops from 7 meg um, to, to 120 all the way down to 129k. And in many cases, the the output. If we look at Libya, the output is smaller than the, uh, than, uh, than, than, than a single object file worth of the input. I think that's fairly acceptable compression. Um, Time-wise, it takes almost no time at all, even though it's single-threaded and not really optimized. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit to improve there as well. Um, what's the support like in the tool chain? It's on, it's on GCC 12 master, pass in minus GCTS. Um, it's in Gnu LD. You don't need to pass anything. If there's CTF on the on the input, you get you get compressed uh, and um, deduplicated CTF on the output. It's in Objdump. It's in Redel. I'll show you in a moment. Um, it's not in Gold yet. I'll have I'll have to add that at some point. Um, and it, it, uh, and 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 Gnu LD does not su um, support non elf platforms to, with CTF at the moment. It just hasn't been plumbed in. Um, there's no support in LLVM at all. It just hasn't been added. People have been asking occasionally. It, it, it might get it should get done eventually. It might get done eventually. People have also been asking for C plus plus. That might get done eventually as well. <laughs> GDB we support uh, we support CTF, uh, um, we support CTF dictionaries fully. P type works. Obviously, quite a lot of GDB features don't work without dwarf. But if you want info on types, we can give it to you. Um, there are other things GDB users will be likely to want, but that's what the main subject of this talk is about. Um, there's more support. GNU poke can, re, uh, can read CTF. Um, um, it's, it's actually a, a, a very nice at this sort of thing. Um, I, I use it in development these days. Um, LibAbigail um, can take in executables that contain only CTF um, and do ABI analysis of them. And if we end up with most executables containing CTF, which we might because it's small, this means you'll be able to see whether things are ABI compatible without installing any kind of debug info at all. It also means that things might be able to might be able to check for ABI compatibility at runtime. They just need to call on call on libctf and ask it, or or on libavs. So a quick demo. Turn on. We have here two really exciting translation units. Um, one can t um, they, they contain almost the same almost the same content, except that except that in one case uh, um, the uh, uh, struct foo has an extra member. Um, struct foo is annoying because it points to itself, um, uh, 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 and uh, uh, cycles are a known bane of, uh, of, of systems like this. Um, what happens? What happens if you link this together? Let's try it. Here we have some CTF, there's two k of it. Here we can dump it. Just want to see what it looks like. I think maybe I should make this window full size. And this, this is the, 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 dot, the dot .cdf section. The, uh, the, uh, the, the main dictionary. There's all sorts. There's all sorts of stuff in here. Most, uh, most significantly, there is an IO. There is an IO file. We use Stylio, so there's a file star in there, completely, completely represented. Um, 
um, all, all the pointers and so on are shared. The only unshared things in the individual archive members down here are, are, are the actual structure, which differed. Here it, here it is in one CU with, uh, with FUBAR and Next. Here it is in the other one with FUBAR, uh, with FUBAR, with FUBAR the, the, the extra integer and Next. It's been duplicated about as well, about as, well as you can hope, and all the, all, all the types are fully represented. And if you look here, the data, data objects, it knows that stood there is a file star. And it knows what sort of thing a file star is, and it knows, it knows that it turns into a struct IO file. Um, despite the fact that we didn't bother to, bother to tell it any, any of that GCC and we did it for it. So we, this is all, it's still done with an underlying API. Um, other, other people could use it. It's divided into several sections. You can query the properties of types. You can open and click. You can open. You can open an elf, elf objects, and you get a, diction, a CTF dictionary back or a CTF archive. You can dig over the archives and find types in them, and that sort of thing. You can walk over struct members, types, anything there, anything in CTF. You can iterate over it. You can create. You can you can add members. You can create them. The CTF knows everything about how to create CTF dictionaries. So um, so, uh, so you never need, you should never need to write your own code to do it. Or you can if you like. To, there is a spec. Um, and you can link them together in about in about five lines of code, which is which is quite nice. It means you can write tiny linkers in about in about two hundred lines. Um, and those are tiny. It would be about ten lines if it hadn't done it. Hadn't had, it had wanted to do exactly what GNU LD did. But in that case, you can just use GNU LD. Uh, what's coming? CTSD four is being planned for. Uh, the big thing is, of course, battery support, um, which is halfway between CTF and the user of CTF, really, and it, because it has to work with no, CT, uh, with no, no need for the caller to read CTF at all. Um, that's what the rest of this talk is about. But also, we're planning to improve expressiveness because there are some things in the type system, that, in the GNU C type system, that we can't represent yet, all um, syntax extensions and that sort of thing. Um, we can improve compactness in various ways, reduce the space used to the string table by cutting it into chunks, um, use a better compressor than GZIP for thinking, we're thinking Z stood. Um, there's, the, 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 there's, a, there's, a, there's a bunch of things planned. We even have some plans for V5 because we don't want to do everything all at once in one gigantic format bump. The existing CTF will always be readable even when new formats are, uh, uh, even when new formats are generated. Um, I don't see any, any reason to ever drop support for old versions. Um, and there are more things. There's a, there's a link here to them. Anyway, back to Windu. Um, let's then kick off the discussion on backtraces by looking at some use cases and how their requirements vary. I have classified them into two categories, online and offline. The category of online backtracing is basically all those um, use cases where the application is in a production-like environment and the cost of generating backtraces is borne by the application. The cost being um, CPU cycles and program memory because the relevant debug sections need to be loaded in the memory. Conversely, in case of offline backtracing, the cost of uh, backtracing is not draining on the application as they are often run after the fact, like in a crash report analysis tool or a debugger. So classic examples of online backtracers are profilers, crash reporters, exception handling, and uh, live patching. Now let's look at the requirements one by one. Online backtracers need to be fast, right? They need to be precise, um, sometimes extremely precise, like in case of live patching, they need to be extremely precise. Otherwise, they are, well, it, it's not usable otherwise. Asynchronous unwind, it's a capability, which basically means that you need to be able to unwind uh, from any PC. Now, that capability is also a must have for online backtracers. Um, to achieve all these goals, it is vital that the unwinder itself be small and that the debug information for unwinding itself as well be small, right? So, so both so online backtracers need that the unwinder be small and the debug info as well be small some online backtracers may also need uh, the original value of the arguments in backtraces uh, in contrast now for offline backtracing use cases all these features are in a good to have category as you can reason about them so 
the takeaway uh, from this slide is that there are these two categories of backtracing and the requirements vary a lot. And we are focusing on the case of online backtracing um, for uh, CDF. So for online backtracing, what is the state of the art? How are these generated anyway, right? So in many, if not most cases, online backtracing is based on EH frame sections. Um, these are dwarf based sections and these sections encode the fundamental um, information needed for backtracing, which is given a PC, what is the CFA and RA? CFA is a short form for canonical frame address. Uh, think of it as the frame address, which is um, uh, which is at the, before the function starts, what is the frame address? And CFA just points you to that. Each frame sections are the default for many targets. And um, there is this EH frame header sections as well, which are basically which, which basically allow you a, a faster lookup of the information in EH frame. So using read elf, let's see the contents of a sample EH frame section. As you see, EH frame gives us clearly for each PC a way to recover CFA, RA, and some other quality save registers if they made it if they made it to stack. Um, uh, so as you also see, sometimes if you go from one PC to the next, there is not much change in some columns. So look at RBP. In the first IP, it is undefined, but there onwards for each IP, it is defined, but it is the same. So it says CFA minus 16. It's present. RBP is stored at a location, CFA minus 16. Now, so there is a lot of repetition in this information, right? If stored in this tabular format, and this is precisely the reason what EH frame actually stores is some dwarf opcodes, which are executed on a simple stack machine to generate the contents of the table we saw in the previous slide. So this is a compact way of storing that kind of information. But if you are the unwinder, you need to execute these opcodes at runtime to figure out what this, how the CFA recovery will be done. Right, so that creates a problem for for any unwinders written for for basically EH frame based unwinders, and they they are slow because at the time of this this makes them slow because at the time of uh, generating the back traces you now need to execute these opcodes to figure out the CFA and RA etc. They are large because of the same reason the unwinders need to implement a simple stack machine. To, to, to run these opcodes and figure out the information at runtime. Now, the second issue with EH frame-based approach is the maintenance of handwritten assembly. Now, um, so these, these EH frame sections, they are generated by the assembler, and the assembler processes what are called the CFI directives. And if you hand code parts of your application, then you as a programmer are also responsible for hand coding these CFI directives as well. CFI are call frame information directives. And this can sometimes get quite complicated because if your if your standard and assembly uses stack in a standard way, this is relative this is arguably easy to do. But if your handed and assembly does non-standard stack usage, then you may have to deal with what are called dwarf expressions. Now, writing CFI directives with dwarf expression is not going to be very maintainable. Lastly, if you if you do end up needing original value of your arguments for your online backtracing, that's not going to be easy. The information is stored in dwarf debug sections, and which can be pretty large to consume at runtime. So, in reality, because of these issues with EH frame-based methods, there exist a number of unwind formats. So that's the state of the art, right? EH frame is not the only one out in the field. Uh, many applications that we have looked around, um, they have tried to come up with their own debug formats, trying to, uh, you know, steer away from uh, EH frame-based methods. Kernel, for example, has its own unwind format called the object rewind capability. No, sorry, oops, rewind capability, perhaps. Uh, anyway, various other projects that we ran that we ran into also created their own ad hoc solutions around the problem. 
the important bit here is that these ad hoc solutions and their unwind formats are not supported in the GNU toolchain, and which makes all of these uh, ad hoc solutions a big ordeal. And lastly, well, if you still want to recover, if you still need means to recover original value of the arguments, the state of the art remains that um, you need to get that information from goal, uh, dwarf call site information, which lies in the debug info sections. Now, remember all those problems with dwarf, they may, the dwarf may be stripped out, they are large, and it's going to be slow just because of the size of the things. So CDF backtrace format aims to solve these issues by providing um, a solution um, it tries to it the thing the premise here is that if you aim for the following requirements you will be able to solve uh, the previously mentioned problems number one you must provide means for asynchronous track unwinding otherwise the backtraces are not going to be useful number two yes have some extensions in the CTF format, but keep the format compact and simple. Do not add complex expressions and coding to no stack machines whatsoever. And number three, allow means to recover original value of the arguments to the function call. Some online backtracers need this and it's a must have for them. Excuse me. So we plan to introduce a new section called um, .ctf frame. We will only talk about high level details at this time. The section stores information on how to recover CFA and RA given the PC. It does not store information on how to recover other Kali saved registers. Conceptually, it's going to be equivalent right, to the table of interpreted dwarf data but not the full table as compared to EH frame because we only need to know about CFA and RA, right? So we are starting out with uh, support for e AMD64 and ER64, but there is no reason why other arches and ABIs cannot be accommodated. We are working to support for the generation of CDF backtrace format in the GNU toolchain. Uh, toolchain is the ideal place where such a format uh, needs to be supported because we know from existing ad hoc solutions that anything other than toolchain becomes very difficult to maintain and extend. So let's talk about what CDF backtrace format has to offer for recovering original value of the arguments. In debug format jargon, this is often called call site information. Uh, let's first revisit the background again. Um, how are arguments passed to a function, right? So there is the there is these ABIs that define the parameter passing rules. Um, the first bit that an ABI specifies is how to assign a storage class to an argument. So given a high level language type, if you write um, foo and it has two arguments in A in B, it tells you, so given these high level language types, ints and floats and whatnot, what is the corresponding machine type? Uh, um, AKA the storage class. Next, <clears throat> excuse me, given the storage class, the ABI rules, the ABI defines rules on how to define, how to assign uh, appropriate register or stack location. Excuse me. Huh. So the advantage of, um, of, of, uh, of, Approaching the problem in this way is that you can you can potentially find a way to relieve the debug format of specifying the exact register location, right? So in this case, um, the exact register location set is going to be a larger set, whereas storage location set is going to be a smaller set across ABIs. Now each ABI, as you know, will offer you know different set of registers and. Uh, but the storage classes are going to be pretty similar across ABIs or a smaller set rather, right? Um, so uh, as an example, let's see, AMD64 looks like this, integer, SSC, SSC, up, memory, and so on. For AR64, similar looking classes with some differences, of course, right? So as you see, the set of storage classes and AMD64 look similar. So this is the main premise we are relying on 
the storage location of the argument is not encoded explicitly in the debug format. The natural location is inferred from the position and class of the argument and the ABI by the client, right? It's not encoded in the debug format. So if it is a bit hazy still, I hope it is clearer with this example. So function one is a function with six integer arguments. The AMD64 AVI mandates that the arguments be passed via RDI, RSI, RCX, and so on in order. Now, as far as the call site information is concerned, it should be enough if the debug format conveys that the arguments are of integer class and the backtrace client with an understanding of the API can conclude that because the storage class was integer, I know that these arguments will be passed via RDI, RSI, and so on. So in interest of time, again, I will skip through the second example where one of the arguments is a small aggregate. But as you see, what we need is just an unambiguous way to convey the storage class, and the rest can be done by the backtrace client. So the call site information addition is being planned in two phases so that the addition of the CDF format, the additions to the CDF format are done in a data-driven and thoughtful way. In phase one, we will focus on what we talked about previously, that the original value of the argument can be recovered from its natural location if it is not clobbered. And what you encode is just some information about storage classes. Now, clearly, there will be cases when these natural locations will be clobbered by the colleagues. So an option, so as an option there is to, uh, there is to fall back on is, um, is explicit saving of argument values on stack if the user chooses to do so. And the format facilitates the recovery to, of the original value of the arguments from stack. So to summarize, CTF back traces, um, we discussed today that the format extensions, uh, to support unwind information and call site information are underway. We looked at the requirements of online backtracing and to fulfill those requirements, we have to keep the format minimal. Um, we are working on these format changes and incorporating the support in GNU toolchain. Finally, to wrap it all up, CDF, we introduced CDF today and a CDF is a debug format that's compact and fast. Uh, at this time, it is um, type information for C programs only and is fully supported in the GNU toolchain. Um, it is evolving to address unfulfilled requirements around debugging and backtracing. If you are interested and if you want to participate, have questions, you can reach us on any of these um, public mailing lists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Indu uh, and Nick and Adsentia for um, for sharing all that with us. Wow, um, that was really interesting and thorough look at, I guess, the new possibilities um, in the future. So thanks. Um, is there anything you'd like to say? Thanks. <laughs> Um, well, yes, thank you so much. Round of applause for Indu and Nick. Um, and that was our last talk for today, everyone. Last talk for Linux Conf AU 2022, but don't close the window yet. Um, so we will have the conference closing in this very room um, in about 15 minutes because this talk is finishing up a little early. Uh, so don't go anywhere. The conference closing is always worth watching. Um, It'll be lovely to see the wrap up. Um, but from me, that's it from me. So thank you for joining us all today with all of these wonderful talks. Bye everyone.